Okay, so uh, here's where we left off last time. Um, I am going to let you all uh, think through all the details of this example that we sort of kind of didn't quite uh, do last time. This is where we sort of left off. Uh, it's a lot like this previous example, right? Um, uh, what I want to remind you all of with this as a, uh, you know, to sort of support the point um, is that you do have to really start paying attention when you start drawing pictures or interpreting pictures um, as to exactly what kind of a picture is it. Uh, because now there really are different kinds. Now, again, reminder, in Calc 1, Calc 2, a vast majority of the discussions, there was really only one kind of picture. That was the graph, right? And so if uh, there's only one kind of picture, there's really nothing to keep track of. You just you just make, connect. you know, algebra, calculus has certain geometric interpretations, and that's just what they are, and that's just how you think, and there's, there's no sort of, like, organization to sort of uh, have to worry about. But now there really is. I remind you, the calculus of graphs, in other words, what does calcul? What are the geometric interpretations of calculus in the context of graphs? Very, very different from the calculus of level sets, uh, which is very, very different from the calculus of parameterizations. Right. So now, at this point, you're going to be looking at various pictures in this course, and you know, going forward. Uh, and if you want to either uh, you know make interpretations of what you're seeing geometrically or if you want to make a geometric interpretation of something that you know algebraically well uh, you better know which context you're in so that you can make the appropriate interpretations otherwise you'll in inadvertently write down uh, you know complete garbage and this is always something we're trying to avoid as much as possible so reminder um, looking at this line here with that equation um, that line is a graph because if you set this function equal to z, and keep in mind that setting the function equal to a new variable, that's what a graph is, uh, then, uh, then you uh, effectively get that line. Right? So that means that we're looking at the graph of that function. Um, on the other hand, here's a function that if you set equal to a constant, Six in this case. Setting equal to a constant being how you construct a level set, right? That means that we get, because we get the same equation, that this line is a level set. Now, it's a level set of this other function. It's not a level set of f. That doesn't make any sense at all, <coughs> right? Um, it's a level set of this other importantly different function. It's not just different in formula. It's different in type. It's a function of two variables instead of just one. Right? It's totally different critter. Um, and uh, if you want to understand this line, any geometric aspects of this line as relates to how level sets work, you've got to go by way of the calculus of this function, not that other one. Okay. Um, lastly, there's going to be some calculus of parameterizations. Uh, well, you know, we've already seen kind of some of that, right? We know that, for example, that when you take the derivative of a parametric curve, that's calculus, then we get a, an object of geometric interest, namely a uh, tangent vector, velocity vector, right? So that's, we've already sort of started talking about the calculus of parameterizations. Um, and, uh, well, so this is not a parameterization. This is not a parameterization, right? <coughs> this is a parameterization, uh, which you can confirm for yourselves by taking that, plugging it in as your x, taking uh, this and plugging it in as your y, and observing that the equation works. Right? Um, so uh, all three different functions that relate to the same line by way of, well, three different types of constructions. Yeah? Um, how did you, like, come to the point of deciding those are, like, the coordinates for Oh, uh, so th th this is, uh, go back to section 12.4, right? And you can, there's a discussion about how to parameterize uh, lines there. So you can just apply those ideas. Uh, and there's different ways to parameterize lines. This is not the only parameterization. There are lots of parameterizations. But yeah, it's a 12.4 thing. You'll recognize it when you get there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So make sure to be uh, uh, carefully aware of the difference between these different kinds of constructions. Okay. All right. Um, go, uh, going forward, uh, a few more things I want to talk about. Um, roughly speaking, I want to give you the sales pitch for why level sets are worth talking about. And here's this first pitch that I'll give. Every graph is a level set. 
you can always do that. If you're looking at a graph, you can interpret that instead as a level set. Now, it's a level set of a different function, not the same function, of course. That wouldn't make any sense. Okay. Um, but it is a level set of some other function. And here's uh, how the algebra works. Uh, let's suppose we're looking at uh, some function uh, f. Right? We can talk about the graph of f. Graph means set the values, output values equal to some variable, some new variable, not one of the inputs. Right? That's what a graph is. And so the graph of that function is described by that equation. Now, innocent observation, that equation is exactly the same equation as that equation. All I did is I took the thing on the right and I moved it over to the left, the minus sign, right? I mean, ultra basic, no big deal. Well, here's the thing. This, this equation describes a level set. Right? So that's the neat observation. Whenever you're looking at a graph, you can just move every, the graph is an equation. You can take that equation, move everything over to one side, <coughs> bam, you're looking at a level set of something. So, uh, neat fact, every graph is a level set. Now, uh, let's be careful to notice that, uh, again, these are different functions. That function whose graph we're looking at, that function whose level set is the same surface, the same thing, uh, these are very, very different functions. And you can see it right here. What is the function whose graph I'm looking at? Well, it's this function here. It's got n input variables, one output variable. It's called f. Right Now, on the other hand, what is this thing whose level set is equivalent? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's not F. Uh, <clears throat> I see F as part of the formula. Yeah, 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 sure. But this is a different function. Importantly different. It's got a different formula. It's got a different number of input variables. Look at this. This thing's got <coughs> n plus 1 input variables. Y is an input variable to this function whose level set is the graph we were looking at previously. Right, so this is a very different function. Um, and uh, you gotta, you know, be heads up about that. So in any situation, you know, if you're looking at a graph of one function, be careful with this little algebra, and more so be careful with the interpretation of this algebra and make sure that you're interpreting the correct function. So let me give you an example. Uh, let's look at, um, um, this is our f, and I can talk about its graph, right? The way you make a graph, again, you set the value of the function equal to a new variable. In this case, I'm um, using z, right? So the graph is described by that equation, which, of course, is equivalent to this equation, right? These are the same, I mean, morally. They're certainly equivalent equations. Okay? Uh, well, what is the function whose level set I'm looking at here? Here, let me do this with the... I'm looking at a level set there. Right? Well, it's not F. F was that thing. Right? Uh, G, the thing that I set equal to a constant, the thing whose level set is that graph is this other function. And you see there's the additional variable. right? It's got three input variables, X, Y, and Z not just X and Y. Okay. So a neat trick. Um, by, uh, by the way, situations will arise very often, well, yeah, it's often enough that we need to really care about this, where a surface may initially be described as a, as a graph of something, um, and where you uh, need to make an interpretation, but the problem is the interpretation you need to make uh, it comes from the calculus of level sets. Well, you're not looking at the surface initially as a level set you're looking at as a graph. You can't just, you know, take that square peg and shove it into that round hole. Um, you have to reinterpret the surface that was given to you as a graph. You have to reinterpret it as a level set, a la this trick right here. Right? Identify that function, new function, at which point now you can make cool interpretations from the calculus of level sets. And we'll see all those details uh, later on. Okay. Um, by, by the way, this is a one-way deal. Every graph is a level set, but not every level set is a graph. And this easy counterexample, right here, we see a level set. Right, this equation x squared plus y squared equals one. That's the unit circle in the xy plane. Clearly, a level set. It's not a graph of anything. 
Anyway, it just isn't. Fails the vertical line test. Badly. So, it's kind of a neat feature about level sets. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you can always do it. It's always an option. Right? Graphs aren't. Um, here's another thing that's nice about level sets. They're what I like to call uh, dimensionally simpler. Um, and uh, so, you know, an easy uh, easy example here. Let's look at uh, this function of two variables. And it's tempting to say, well, we can draw a graph. Here it is. You know, it's you know, got to do some work to, you know, think through uh, why that's what the graph is. Take various cross sections. It's a good exercise, by the way. Not unlike some homework exercises that you either have or will be doing. Um, but um, anyway, there's the graph. Problem is, drawing surfaces in three space is hard, right? And one could make the case, I still haven't done it, right? That that thing that you're looking at there, that's a that's a vague uh, outline, right? I mean, you can arguably make the case that you know I've drawn this, but really I've made a drawing on a two-dimensional piece of paper. Right? This could be one of those optical illusions. You know, have y'all seen those, those, they have these art, th uh, installations where, you know, you look at something and it's like, oh yeah, that's a picture of a face. And then you walk around to, the, uh, to, to look at, take a side view and it's like, oh, it's not a face, it's a horse. Right? It's just because you can't perceive the distance. And so what something looks like in a projection, that's what we're drawing here, doesn't really tell you what three-dimensionally that thing looks like. Right? Everybody see what I'm talking about? So, that's one complaint, but an even bigger complaint is I didn't, there is not so much as the slightest little bit of ink anywhere in there telling you anything about, at all, about what the surface is doing there, right? So really what I've got here is uh, kind of an appeal, uh, kind of a, I'm, I'm using your psychology to persuade you that I've done something that I totally haven't, <laughs> namely, actually given a reasonable representation of that graph. Okay, so uh, it's not only hard to do, it's really bad in a lot of ways. Whereas, on the other hand, level sets, set it equal to a constant, right? There's the level set. That's actually it. This isn't just a con job of me trying to convince you of, you know, use your imaginations and you could probably conjure what that level set looks like. Nope, that's it. That's the level set. And we can complain about my artistic incompetence, of course, right? But nevertheless, it is something that can be drawn perfectly. My, again, artistic incompetence aside. Um, so um, <coughs> that's a pretty strong appeal, right? Dimensionally simpler is a big deal. Yes? So this is the level set that you get when you set this equal to, uh, you know, some constant, right? And then you're correct that, you know, this here is a different level set. That's what you get when you set it equal to a different constant. So now if your goal is to have a complete geometric understanding of the function, then you could still complain about what I've done here. What I've done here is I've drawn some of the level sets, but I haven't drawn all the level sets. Right? And if you think about it, if I were to draw all of the level sets, then this entire piece of paper would just be all black. <laughs> right? Because every point is part of some level set. And so uh, if I can uh, get this all done here. Uh, okay, there. I just drew all the level sets. <laughs> right? So it becomes sort of ridiculous at some point. So it's not perfect either, uh, but it's got some pretty significant advantages uh, over uh, drawing graphs. And certainly I can draw one level set um, very well. Okay. Now, the dimensional advantage here, I think pretty strong, but still not as strong as here. Let's look at that function with three input variables. Again, not weird. Nothing rare about this. That function, I can draw level sets. It's a little bit of a challenge. And again, I'm having to use your psychology. And again, I'm not really doing it. But nevertheless, I mean, this, you know, conjures an image in your mind of what I'm talking about if I say, you know, the level sets are, you know, these uh, ellipsoid surfaces. And uh, there's the equation. You got a little something that's geometrically satisfying to work with. Couldn't begin to draw the graph. Graph's got four variables. Right? The graph would involve setting this equal to a fourth variable, let's call it W, and uh, I, I can't draw a picture in R4. Can't even fake it. 
right? So when you're dealing with a function of three variables, graphs are not an option. Off the table. Level sets are all you have to possibly work with. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, new topic now. We're going to move on and talk about limits. Uh, Y'all remember limits from <coughs> Calc 1, I hope. Um, a lot of y'all, by the way, uh, let me recognize, uh, a lot of y'all uh, came to Duke with AP credits, which is super, you know, good for y'all, uh, which means that you saw single variable calculus in high school, which means you got a high school presentation, I'm sure it was, I'm sure your high school teacher was very good, blah, 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 but there's some just uh, unavoidable disadvantages to learning calculus in a high school context, and uh, very often uh, subtleties. Um, are what get uh, what get sacrificed. Um, there's a lot of subtleties in thinking about limits, right? And so it is a very common story that students get into this class. Uh, you know, again, you know, five on the BC exam, and you know, it's very strong, I'm sure. But uh, with a uh, kind of weak understanding of limits, this is not rare. In fact, it's most of the time. I admit that might be a bit of an overstatement. It's very, very common, right? So. Um, I'm going to assume in this discussion that you have a good understanding of single variable limits. Uh, I am going to point out certain things as we go along as to, hey, you know, if you're not strong with single variable limits, here's a little sticking point that you're going to need to brush up on, right? But we, we can't do the actual brushing up on single variable limits uh, in this class because, again, I have to assume. Uh, so uh, anyway, come to my office hours. If you think you might be weak with single variable limits, and if some of these pet things that I point to, if you're like, I don't know what he was talking about there, eh, come to my office hours. We'll straighten it out. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, quick reminder, uh, when you're doing single variable calculus, the idea, uh, one of the ideas, we're not going to get rigorous, by the way. The, uh, um, there's much rigor that can be put into the idea of limits. Um, uh, an entire field of math, uh, one could say, is about you know uh, worrying about taking stuff like this seriously. Um, so anyway, we're not going to do that at all in Math 212. Epsilon delta definitions, for example, not going to do that in this course. Um, so I am going to do some uh, kind of hand waving, broad brush stroke stuff, uh, but uh, not the rigor. So I, I am in some sense uh, apologizing um, for uh, for that. But it's just uh, it can't be helped. That's just not what this course is. Okay. So that said, hand waving sense. A single variable limit requires that look when you approach from the left and when you approach from the right, you need to be able to get um, the same thing from both sides. Is that a familiar concept? Right. The left hand limit can't be different from the right hand limit, and then claim that the the limit exists. That's just you know. they can be different, but then the limit simply doesn't exist. Okay. All right, well, we're going to kind of rip off that idea in the multivariable context, um, and it's just that if you have a multivariable domain, and just for clarity, let me um, make it clear here that I'm talking about uh, that, you know, we have a function where this is the domain and uh, this is the target. So I'm, I'm, the picture that I'm drawing on the left, circled in green there, that's just a picture of the domain. That's not somehow like a graph or something uh, or anything like that. Okay, so in this domain, we're going to require that no matter which direction you approach a point from, if you approach, you know, like that, or if you approach like that, or if you bend it in, or if you do some wacky spirally thing, no matter how you approach that point, we need for the, the limit as you approach along each of these curves to always give you the same thing. Uh, it's motivated, again, by you know thinking about, well, we required that in Calc 1. Okay. All right. Um, this is going to be a, a very great tool in uh, helping us uh, consider certain kinds of questions about limits. Now, I do want to recognize, before we actually go on to doing that, that uh, these pictures I've drawn are kind of weird pictures, right? Only the domain. And uh, this looks like an incomplete picture. Like, where's the y-axis? Why didn't I draw the y-axis? Well, I didn't want to draw a graph. I wanted to draw just the domain. Because here I wanted to draw just the domain, and I wanted to be consistent in perspective here. So you say, 
how about we just always draw graphs because that's what I'm accustomed to, <coughs> right? Well, here's the problem. There's that familiar picture in the graph context, right? We got a single variable function, calc one, uh, and you know this, uh, you know, in the domain, the idea that as you approach, you get the same values. The suggestion then is, well, then the graph. As you do those, you know, blue approaches, then on the graph you need the, oh, you know, the, the graph needs to be approaching, um, and there needs to be a, a, a single point that they're both approaching, right? And then you visualize the limit as being, you know, what is the uh, y coordinate of that, you know, that point that uh, that uh, that they're both approaching. Right? So familiar, satisfying, right? And setting up a problematic precedent for doing the same thing in multivariable calculus because here's the equivalent uh, picture in multivariable calculus. If you have, again, world's most innocent multivariable function, two input variables, one output variable, right? The easiest multivariable function you can imagine. And already, we're back to this situation of, well, here's what the graph looks like and... Uh, I can't really draw the whole thing. I mean, I, if I if I draw what I've outlined in purple there, well, that's a, that vaguely conjures that uh, this is kind of a you know it's doing something kind of like this maybe right. But I still have not drawn anything in here other than the you know my attempt at hypnotizing you. I've given you no indication of what's actually going on on the curve. Or, or on the surface around there or are there and we just really don't have a good picture to work with even given that it was hard to draw <laughs> right so this is just it's a it's a tough uh, picture to work with now again you can take wax at it like I mean here's you know the best I can do in this case I could say you know will I want to you know as I approach in the domain from these different directions uh, okay so let's uh, you know try to draw then I, I could draw just the part of the surface sitting above that green approach curve <coughs> and over here I could draw you know just the part of the surface sitting above that green approach curve but uh, it's a lot of trouble to go to and in fact most of the time we don't really need the graph picture so Bear in mind, most of the pictures that you're going to see when we're doing multivariable limits, most of the pictures you're going to see are not graphs. They're mostly going to be pictures of the domain. This is what we really need to focus on most of the time anyway. Right? So that's, just, again, just for perspective. Don't in try to interpret these coming pictures as graphs. They aren't graphs. They're just pictures of the domain. Okay, so with that in mind, let's um, let's do one. I'm going to try to understand uh, this uh, this limit right here. Um, so I'm approaching the origin, right? And I want to consider what happens as x approaches the origin. Uh, what uh, what happens to this function? What's the you know hopefully fingers crossed? Hope this works out. But what's the limit of this function as I approach the origin? Now, how am I going to approach the origin? Well, I've got to consider a bunch of paths. For example, I'm going to start by considering <coughs> this approach along the x-axis. Right. Keep in mind, along the x-axis means y is equal to 0 and x is approaching 0. That's the same as saying along the x-axis. Right. And uh, let's uh, see what happens. All right. Okay. Well, here's the thing. You can plug in y equals 0. Just plug that right on in there. Right, every point on this curve that I am interested in doing this calculation on, every point on that curve has y equal to 0, flat equal to 0. So you can just do that. Um, there's a temptation to then furthermore say, <coughs> well, look, x is approaching 0, so come on. It's like it's as if it's 0, and to want to then plug x equals 0 in as well. You can't do that. Now, this is a callback to Calc 1, right? So make sure you're comfortable with the idea from Calc 1 that that's not the case. You cannot just plug in x equals 0 because it's approaching 0. In fact, quite the opposite. In fact, when you take a limit as x is approaching 0, what you're saying is explicitly that 
this says x will never be actually allowed to be zero. So this doesn't mean x equals zero. This means x is not equal to zero. Important distinction. Again, this is a flashback to Calc 1. Um, if you're rusty on that business, come talk to me in office hours. I'll be happy to clarify. Okay, that said, uh, here's what happens. Again, you know, you plug in the y equals zero. So you get a zero there and a zero there. Here's what your algebra turns into. Uh, by the way, zero times x is zero. No need to pump the brakes on that. Y is zero. Why is it approaching zero? Y is <coughs> zero. And zero times, I don't care what it's times, zero times anything is zero. Yeah? Okay, uh, the denominator, well, again, that's a zero, so that term goes away, that's just zero, but here we remain with x squared and the denominator. Again, resist that urge to say, well, x is approaching zero, so it's kind of like it's zero, so I'm just going to plug it in as zero. Don't do that, right? Not true. Okay, so in this limit, as x is approaching zero, I am interested in uh, this expression here. Here's some good news about that expression. It's zero divided by not zero. And that's zero. Just plain old algebra. Right? Um, and so uh, we're done. That uh, along the x-axis, we get zero. Okay. All right, again, if you're a little rusty on the cal single variable calculus, single variable limits, come talk to me. Okay, now, do keep in mind, we've got to check along all possible curves, right? We just checked along a curve. That doesn't prove squat about this multivariable limit. The multivariable limit requires that we get the same answer along every different possible curve, no matter what, approaching that point, right? So we're going to have to try a bunch more points. Uh, yeah, it was a hand, no? Okay, yeah, no worries. Um, okay, let's try along... Actually, let's get efficient about this. Let's not just do one curve at a time. If I do y equals mx, notice that that takes me to the origin. right? But if I write it as y equals mx, I'm actually doing an infinite number of lines all at the same time because I can, after having done this calculation, I can say, now I can let m be whatever value and I'm simultaneously considering all of these lines all at once. E even even the y equals zero line that I that I started with, that's just when m equals zero. Right? So this is a much more efficient <laughs> thing to do. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, <coughs> y equals mx. Well, good news. Y being mx, I can just plug that in. Yeah, question? Uh, why do you decide to use like y equals mx rather than like yeah, no, uh, uh, I am responsible for checking all lines, right? Or excuse me, all curves. Um, and uh, strategy is why I'm doing y equals mx. Um, it's because it's easier. And if I get, if it were to turn out, fingers crossed, that I get a contradiction, like if I get a different answer along this curve than I did along that curve, then I've got this situation and I can instantly declare victory. I can say, oh, look, for the limit to exist, I need to get the same answer along different uh, along every curve. I have found two curves that give me different answers. What are you trying to pull here? This is, You can't do that. That <coughs> limit doesn't exist, right? So I'm hoping strategically to find bad news so that I can uh, get all outraged, declare the limit doesn't exist, and uh, move on. And it's not my problem what happens on wacky, weird curves. Right, so that's the hope. Uh, so start with the simple ones, uh, out of pure self-interest. Yeah. Right. Yes. You'd think so. You'd think so, but it doesn't. Um, now that's a great question, and uh, <laughs> you, you would. It's a great question. I want to defer for a little bit later in today's talk, uh, but uh, sadly, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, so keep in mind, now this describes, you know, all of these curves, right? And you could say that, well, yeah, but they go through different points. Like that one goes through that point and this one goes through that point, right? The way I get them all tied down to and, you know, addressing this single point is I have then the x coordinate required to go to zero, right? And as the x coordinate goes to zero, all of these curves hit the origin. Yeah. Yes. Um, does it matter the equation that you start off with, like the um, x y over x squared plus y squared, or is it like 
Uh, it's a free country, and you're allowed to do whatever you want to do, right? Um, uh, now, uh, what is required is that the curves that you choose to approach the point in question, they do have to actually pass through the point in question, right? So uh, I can't I can't choose, for example, if I were to say instead of y equals mx, let's do y equals x plus k. Those those don't pass through the point. I need to pass through the origin, right? I'm interested in the origin. And so, yeah, you can't you can't do stuff like that. But you can pick whatever curves you want that actually go through the point you're interested in. Again, let self interest you know be your guide. Um, I try to start with the easy ones because, hey, if we get a contradiction, then I'm not responsible for doing the hard ones. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. So, so the x coordinate zero because that's the limit. So the only reason the y coordinate zero is because we're where we already did, right? Um, uh, it was up here. Yeah. When I was along the x-axis, where I say y is equal to zero, so we're now doing a totally different calculation. We're no longer looking at along the x-axis. Now we're looking at this limit uh, along y equals mx, and you'll notice I don't plug in y equals zero. I plug in y equals mx. What you see there? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we plug in the y equals mx. Uh, it uh, turns into this. And uh, let's see here. What are we going to do here? Oh, well, I can uh, cancel some common factors. By the way, I hope you all have an instinctive knee-jerk reaction that whenever you cancel, realize that canceling is dividing and realize that you're not allowed to just divide willy-nilly because among, uh, well, more to the point, you're not allowed to divide by zero. Right, so anytime you cancel, you have to worry about the possibility of, oh, did I just inadvertently divide by zero? So if I look at this x squared in the numerator and this x squared in the denominator and say, I'm just going to cancel all common factors of x squared, I just divided by something that I hope it's not zero. Oh, gosh, if it's zero, then I've got to worry about what did I just do and how do I deal with the case of when it is zero? Right. So again, this is another. This is one of these subtleties that tends to get swept under the rug in high school algebra classes. So anyway, uh, something got it. If you if you're if you're not clear on why you should be worried about this, again, come to my office hours. We'll talk about it. Um, here's the good news. In this case, I don't have to worry that I may have just divided by zero, because this right here tells me x is never zero. So the fact that x is not zero is actually good news. Okay. All right. So you cancel the common x squared. Uh, we end up with a limit of uh, constant. And so that limit is equal to this. And notice I get different answers. Uh, therefore, I've got this deal where I've got different values approaching the same point along different curves. The limit couldn't possibly exist. Everybody on board? Okay. In fact, um, if you're clever about it, we don't even need to have done that in the first place. I could just plug in different values in here. Uh, if m is equal to 1, uh, then this turns into uh, a half. And if uh, m is equal to 2, then this expression, uh, let's see, I get uh, 2 fifths. Right? There's a contradiction right there. I don't need to have considered the x-axis in the first place at all. I encourage you not to do that. I started with that because I wanted to you know, look at a single one curve as a starter, right? But uh, in practice, that's inside of this case anyway, so just do these. Okay. All right, so different values along different curves, limit does not exist, and we walk away. Okay. All right, here's another one. Uh, <coughs> again, approaching the origin. Now, again, you do have to be very careful. Uh, you can approach the origin along whatever curves you like as long as those curves actually do, in fact, approach the origin. Now, y equals mx, yeah, those do go to the origin. <laughs> they pass through the origin, so that's okay. But if this weren't the origin, if I was, uh, if x was approaching, you know, 1, 3, then you couldn't, you couldn't do that. That doesn't make any sense. So be careful. But uh, here we're good, uh, approaching the origin, y equals mx, uh, same game. Uh, I'm going to plug in y equals mx uh, there and there and there. See what we get? Uh, we get a 
Uh, by the way, x approaches zero is what makes this go to the origin. Right? So now, uh, as x approaches zero, I'm interested in this limit. Note that there's a common factor of x. This could be any constant, but it is, in fact, constant. And constants, when you multiply them by something that's approaching zero, don't make a difference. Right? So this limit's equal to zero. <coughs> the limit as x approaches zero of x is zero. Everybody comfortable with that? Okay. Okay. All right. So um, now what do we conclude from this? Here's the temptation. The temptation, somebody in the back asked about this. I just tried all possible directions. Isn't that everything I need to consider? Um, and, uh, well, it turns out amazingly that this is not. Uh, there is a possibility that we have to worry about that what if I approached along a curve or a spiral or something like that, that somehow maybe I'd get a different value. And this seems utterly implausible. I mean, come on. I mean, look, here, again, here's the, here's the sort of the, the feeling. When you approach along a curve, at that moment that you hit, you're going in a certain direction. If you had just come along a straight line from that same direction, isn't that the same thing? Uh, it really feels like it should be, but it isn't. Again, example coming, uh, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so what we get here then, is what, what the point I'm trying to make is, because we get the same answer along all different straight lines, we don't get a contradiction. Does that mean that we know something? And sadly, no. It just means that we haven't found a contradiction. There remains the possibility that if I come in along some curve, the answer will be six. <laughs> and so again, it's hard to visualize, but that's we have to recognize that as a possibility. Um, and there's also a possibility that the limit really is equal to zero, and that that's what this is representative of, even though it's not a clear demonstration. And so we just don't know is the point. All right, so let's let's uh, try to bend it in, right? Let's uh, do y equals mx squared. So now we're approaching along uh, parabolas. So here's our, uh, there's the origin that we're approaching, and these curves here, we're coming in along all possible parabolas, which I'm not drawing very well, but coming in on a long, uh, bunch of curves like that. Let's see what happens. Well, y equals mx squared. Plug that into the function that we're interested in. Notice that as this x approaches zero, we do indeed approach the origin. All right? So let's take the limit as scalar x, coordinate x approaches zero. Um, now we have another single variable calculus problem. Uh, how do you uh, deal with this limit? Well, let's see. There's a common factor of x squared in every one of these terms. You can cancel that common factor of x squared because if we know x is not zero. You've got to worry about that. Heads up. Right? Um, once you've canceled the common factor of x squared, you get this. And now I'm just going to say, uh, oh, okay, yeah, I remember a theorem from Calc 1 that the limit of a fraction is the fraction of the individual limits. Do you all remember that theorem? Um, and um, this limit is easily deduced to be 0. That limit is easily deduced to be 1. 0 divided by 1 is 0. Everybody good? Okay. Um, all right, now, reminder, this is another flashback to Calc 1. How come I didn't do that here? Right, why did I cancel the common factor of x squared? Why didn't I just say, oh, let's take the limit of the numerator and divide it by the limit of the denominator and go from there? And the answer is this theorem that I use, this uh, property of limits that, you know, limit of a fraction is equal to the fraction of the limits that I used here has a catch. It's a very important catch. The catch is that if this denominator limit is zero, then you simply cannot do this. This is not true. There is no theorem anywhere that says that when the denominator's limit is zero that you can write this. It's just false. Right? So it's another little subtlety, right? I just want to make sure you're all aware. You can get yourself into trouble if you're not careful about this. 
right? Um, if you're a little too fast and loose with uh, tossing limits around and I'm just going to plug in x equals zero and I'm just going to uh, take a limit of the numerator divided by a limit of the denominator, a little too fast and loose, you will run into problems. And they can be very important problems. Right? So, for example, in this case up here, if you'd been too fast and loose with this, you would have gotten zero divided by zero, which doesn't exist. And uh, I've seen this happen, uh, that students will simply declare that this limit does not exist because by way of their, you know, they didn't do this, they did the nonsense that I just argued against. Uh, they'll go, oh, that doesn't exist, therefore the limit doesn't exist. And it's completely wrong. And it's catastrophic on a test because that means there's nothing correct on the page. And if there's nothing correct on the page, I can't give any partial credit. So it's a, it's a terrible landmine. You really got to watch out for it. So again, come to my office hours if you're uh, uh, rusty on Calc, uh, calc 1 uh, limits. Um, okay, so bummer. We got zero along the straight lines. Along the parabolas, we also got zero. We keep getting zero along every curve we move along. <sighs> How far do I have to do this? I mean, do I have to check the cubics and the quartics and the quintics? And <coughs> that's still not enough because it doesn't consider the spirals or the arctan or the wiggly sort of, you know, knuckleballs. Right? You've got to check all possible curves. Well, that's absolutely uh, uh, intractable. I couldn't begin to... I, I don't have that kind of time. There's infinite it's a big number. There's infinitely many curves. I can't do it, right? That's a problem. So, nevertheless, just because you've done your darndest <laughs> doesn't mean that you've actually proved anything, right? So, it remains that as confident, perhaps, as we might be, we still don't know anything. All right? All right. Now, uh, let's look at uh, one last one. And this is just to persuade you that I'm not wasting your time. Uh, let's look at that limit. It's just a rational function, right? Ratio of two polynomials. Pretty innocent. Okay, a seventh power. Yeah, that's a little weird. But it's still just a polynomial, for crying out loud. Right? This is nothing scary. Right? And here's the weird thing. And I'm going to let you guys uh, fill in these details. But if you try along y equals mx... You get zero along all possible straight lines. If you try along all of these parabolas, <coughs> you'll get zero along all of those parabolas. But look what happens when you try cubics. <laughs> it's so weird. Uh, you plug in M y equals mx cubed. Uh, you cancel the common factor of x to the sixth. And uh, you end up with this limit, uh, which is uh, 1 over m, which is not 0. And we have a contradiction. This limit does not exist. And this is a real worry. You've got to worry about this. So, you know, again, just because you tried all the straight lines, not persuasive. Okay, and I tried all the straight lines and all the... Per oh, come on. I mean... Look at this. I mean, that, I, how many? How, it's unrealistic. Come on, I can't plausibly go through and check all the curves. How about we call this good enough? Surely the limit must equal to zero. Nope. Anybody see the problem? Yes. So what do you Yeah. Um, uh, uh, it's a strategic question, right? So the point is, as you try different curves and keep getting the same answers, you never get to actually conclude something. What you might do is abandon the problem and say, I don't think I'm going to be able to find a contradiction. Let me resort instead to somehow or another trying to prove the limit actually exists um, instead of trying to smart aleck my way around it by finding a contradiction, right? Um, which is always, again, one of what you're hoping for. That's the, that's the good news is when you can sort of show, aha, contradiction, don't have to actually do any real work. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's a strategic question, and... Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that after uh, we talk about it, some more approaches. Um, so, how do you prove a limit exists? <laughs> right? It is not that you're actually going to manually check all infinitely many curves. We've agreed. That's not realistic. But you can effectively 
check all possible curves by making this wonderful observation here, and that, that is uh, that polar coordinates uh, is, is really uh, sort of the perfect tool here. And notice that any curve, right, any curve where x approaches the origin then the polar coordinate r approaches the number 0 and furthermore if the polar co if you have some curve where the polar coordinate r approaches 0 then the parametric curve does indeed approach the origin so you can at any point you'd like replace the idea of this multivariable limit x approaches the origin with instead the co single coordinate r, the single polar coordinate r approaches zero. Uh, I, I wrote equals. I'm sorry. I meant this is approaches. Um, r approaches zero, and that's a single variable limit. You can convert that multivariable limit into a single variable limit and do single variable calculus. And it doesn't. It's not always helpful. But uh, sometimes <laughs> it's exactly what you need. And let me show you uh, the example. Uh, we're going to go back now to, you know, remember this example that we looked at uh, two, two examples back? And we kind of <coughs> had to abandon it because, we you know, along the straight lines, we got zero. And along the parabolas, <sighs> we got zero. And we were just like, oh, we threw up our hands. Like, I don't know what to do about this. Uh, what do we do? It turns out that if you take a polar coordinates approach, it just works. So here we go. There's that same limit. Note that I'm replacing x approaches the origin with r approaches 0. Uh, plug in your polar coordinate formulas. x is r cosine theta. y is r sine theta. Plug all that in. Right. Don't forget, by the way, that uh, x squared plus y squared is r squared. That's another one of our standard polar coordinate formulas. Okay. Um, and we look at this expression. Uh, oh, hey, uh, r is never zero. Um, that means that uh, the common factor of r squared that I have in the numerator and denominator, I can cancel. This turns into that. This limit, I have a factor that's approaching zero. And then I have this other factor that I don't know <laughs> what's going on there. Um, now, uh, well, what, what do we make of all these thetas that have showed up? Well, let me just remind you in the picture here, when we say that you know r is approaching zero, that's just sort of keeping track of the distance. But the angle, right, this theta might be doing who knows what. Theta could be a constant. Um, theta could be... Um, approaching infinity because I'm zipping around in a s tight spiral faster and faster. Um, theta could be uh, oscillating in the knuckleball case. I have no control over what theta is doing because, uh, again, I mean, yes, r approaches zero. Sure, right? But theta could be doing all sorts of who knows what. So, uh, sadly, I don't know anything about theta. Here's the good news. And, again, this this works out in some cases and uh, not all, but in some cases, uh, I don't need to know what theta is doing for that expression. That expression, wacky though it may be oscillating or changing or taking different values, who knows? I don't care. It's bounded. So who cares how big it is or, or how uh, how wacky it is? It's never going to be bigger than 2. It's never going to be smaller than negative 2. Right? So I've got this thing that's bounded between negative 2 and 2, and I'm multiplying it by something that's approaching 0. And that limit is going to be 0. That's a neat argument. Okay. All right, so sometimes you get lucky, and that works out. Now, here's a uh, here's a variation. Let's look at this limit here. Take a polar coordinates approach, and uh, <coughs> skip through the algebra. If you plug in x equals r cosine theta, etc., we get down to this. Here, there is no factor of r. Here, I can't say, oh, the limit is zero. I can, however, find a contradiction. The contradiction is in the fact that, well, if I were approaching along this curve, uh, whoops, this curve, 
theta is one value, and this expression is whatever that, you know, plug in for that value of theta. Right? But if I were to approach along this curve, different value of theta, you get a different value for this expression. There you go. You've got two different curves along which you get different answers. Therefore, the limit doesn't exist. Okay. All right. So this is uh, one thing you can do. You know, if you start plugging in different curves and you're like, this is not working. I plugged in the straight lines. I plugged in the parabolas. And I just never, ah, I keep getting zeros. There's just no contradictions that are coming out. You can try polar coordinates. It's an option. Um, and then uh, next time we're going to talk about a different option that uh, we didn't have time to get to today. Um, so, okay. Um, Got to stop for today. See you all later. Uh, if you showed up after I was check after I finished checking attendance, please do stick around. Make sure I check you off um, and.